Welcome to today's uh, first conference with the Iowa Hawkeyes. And we are joined by Luca Garza, Jordan Bohannon, and Joe Wieskamp. And we will take your questions. Remember, please, that you help everybody if you uh, track down your microphone, uh, have your question ready to go. Once, once a question is being answered, just get one of our very capable assistants to get your uh, microphone ready for the next question and address your question to the players specifically so that we can uh, electronically keep up with what's going on. Uh, and we'll start with your questions for our Iowa players. Jordan, uh, just in the second half there that we talked yesterday about the shooting, to have that out of the gate, how important is that against a team like Tennessee? Yeah, it's going to be really important, uh, especially how they play. Um, another team that uh, different, unique style they play. Um, really run the court, um, so we're going to be ready for that. But for us to get going, we're going to need to make our shots to start the game. I think that was big for Cincinnati to start their game last night against us. Uh, we weren't hitting shots. They got up on a, a big run, um, and it, it really took everything within us to get back into that game. So uh, we'll make the game a lot easier if we're able to get out there right from the start and hit some shots for sure. Go ahead. Jordan, just to follow up on that, you said Tennessee plays a unique style. What about it is unique? I mean, what, what, what makes them different? Well, they definitely have a lot of NBA players potentially on their team, so that's definitely unique in, within its own right. Um, and uh, playing an SEC team, I'm not, I don't think we've played an SEC team yet um, since we've been here. So um, we just got to – they know it's a, it's a tough conference to play in just as well as the Big Ten. So um, they've been battling all year round um, as well as we have. So. We know it's going to be a physical game. Um, they play physical kind of basketball like we do. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun tomorrow. We're looking forward to it. Joe, is it harder or easier in your mind to prepare for a team when you don't have as much time to prepare as you did for game one? I think it's a little bit harder, obviously. But I think our coaching staff's done a great job of trying to get us prepared for this. Um, in the Big Ten season, towards the end of the, end of the year, each team has each other figured out. Um, they have each other locked into personnel, so it's a little bit harder in the end of the Big Ten season. So um, it'll be nice to play another team from a different conference. Luca, that kind of uh, struck me what Jordan said about not playing a, an SEC team. Uh, does, it, does it make a, a difference uh, for something you're familiar with, or do you like the challenge of seeing totally new systems? Um, uh, I don't know. I think both teams, you know, in, in both leagues have very hard schedules and uh, you know each game in the SEC is, is a battle as well as the, the Big Ten so I think both both teams are really well um, you know prepared for this in terms of all the battles we've been through uh, throughout the course of the season and uh, like Joe says just it's nice to play teams from other conferences because at this point you know the Big Ten knows each other so well uh, <laughs> you know they know what your tendencies are even more so than a new team could pick up uh, so quickly. Joe, you just talked about the battles. You've had some couple weekends now in tournament play. They have as well. What do you expect the battle to be like tomorrow with the Sweet 16 on the line? Yeah, they're obviously a very strong team. Um, we're ranked number one in the country at one point. So um, this is what you sign up for when you play, when you sign up to play a Division One basketball. And this is the type of team that you want to play. Uh, so we're just excited for the test. Luca, you're going against another physical opponent. The inside out game that you have, how? in past when you go up against physical teams. How does that just kind of open things up for you guys? Um, I think, you know, uh, you know, I'm a player who just kind of sees what the defense has given me. You know, when they're really aggressive on my post-ups, and I, I tend to go a little bit more outside, try to open it up. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my best to try to, you know, create some space on the floor uh, for our other guys to drive and, and different stuff like that. So, you know, I'm just going to take what the defense gives me. And I think that's some of our whole, you know, offense does. Everybody, you know, they just take what the defense gives us. Yeah, I had one for Luca too. Just wondering your impressions of Kyle Alexander from what you've been able to see, and I guess how important it would be. He's a guy who has had foul trouble at times to try to you know get him some early fouls. Yeah, I mean they're they're a different team when he's not on the court. You know, you can see that when you you watch some of their games. You know, he's really athletic, uh, long, can really affect shots around the rim, and uh, you know he's. Um, you know, when we go into games, you know, we, we have a goal to get their bigs in foul trouble. So I think that, you know, that remains the same with him and Williams this game. Jordan, have you been taken by the Big Ten's success, or is that something you ex expected as they headed into the tournament? 
I mean, I think we all expected it, every single player in the Big Ten. Um, I mean, we went through quite the battle on a night-to-night -night basis uh, this past few months. And for us to go to a 20-game schedule, it made it even more difficult. Um, so we're not surprised at all that the Big Ten started 7-1. Um, I thought we've had really good matchups with teams. And um, quite honestly, I wasn't surprised any team won, or was surprised that any team uh, won, obviously. But uh, I think looking forward, uh, I see more teams advancing in, the, in this tournament. I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if we get the same amount into the Sweet 16 as well. You mentioned matchups. I, I always think that's interesting uh, as you approach a game. Are there teams that you think specifically you match up better because of what they do or don't do? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's difficult in the, in the NCAA tournament because you only have a couple of days to prepare. But um, you look at it, it all comes down to matchups in most games. And um, that's the beauty of the NCAA tournament. You don't have a lot of time to, be, to prepare for it. But um, you got to take what's there during the game. And you got to realize what matchups happen. And, um, and that's something you have to definitely take advantage of. Jordan, Tennessee's given up 15 threes to each of their last two opponents. As a guy who can kind of get it going, does that excite you? And also, how do you guys kind of avoid falling into the trap of getting trigger happy against them? Yeah, um, obviously, I, I love to shoot threes. Um, that's, that's one, every time I step foot on the floor, I'm trying to shoot as much as I can. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Hopefully, I can get a lot of threes off. And um, I know Joe's looking forward to it as well. Luca is too. And um, that's the beauty of our team, though. We have a lot of shooters on this team. Um, and a lot of times we have five shooters out there, so it's really difficult for teams to play us. Um, and Luke can go inside out. Um, Tyler is one of the most dominant inside players, I think, in the NCAA tournament. Um, so we have, we have a really tough team to guard, um, but we also we know what we're capable on defense as well. So um, it's going to come down to getting stops in important times tomorrow. Joe, is there something you've seen from Tennessee as to why they've given up so many seemingly good looks from the perimeter lately? Not necessarily. Um, obviously, we haven't had a whole lot of time to prepare for them. We'll probably be watching a lot of film of them today and kind of figure those different things out, see where we can attack them offensively. Um, I think our coaching staff will be able to give us kind of a game plan um, how to attack that. Anybody else? Terrific job, guys. Thanks very much. Good luck tomorrow. Coach McCaffrey will be here in a couple of minutes. Thank you.
at, at length. You know, I mean, I told him uh, that, uh, you know, anytime he wanted, you guys want to play a little game or something, let me know. That's a great guy. That's a good guy. It's coming up, though. Coach McCaffrey, uh, nice enough to join us. And again, if you just uh, try and have your questions ready to go so that we can keep the pace moving and get everybody's job done. First question. I'll just ask this, Coach. I just, I just ask you, how difficult is it to, uh, to get enough sleep during a, a time like this, with short turnaround? You're not going to get a lot of sleep, but you got to get some because you got to be fresh. Uh, you know, you, you just jump from one game to the next. Uh, obviously, the, the assistant coach responsible for that team has been studying them for quite some time. So we just, you know, we were up late last night, but got a little bit of sleep back up this morning. Had, had a meeting breakfast and then came over here and had a at a live practice which is good get up and down get, you know get a little sweat going have a few more meetings and then uh, get ready to play yeah Fran as you look at Tennessee how much of a difference do you think Kyle Alexander makes for them when he's on the floor and able to stay out of foul trouble they, they, they have great versatility and obviously he provides you know something different with his length and his size, uh, you know, but they can also downshift, go small, and, and put, put some big time weapons out there offensively. Uh, you know, you look at matchups in particular, I think that's maybe what you're also thinking about when you look at our big guys versus their big guys. You know, here, here's a 6'11 guy with length and, and the ability to defend, you know, our scoring post players. But, it, it, you know, it'll be a constant uh, situation where we're, we're, we're both pushing different buttons with different lineups and looking for different things. Coach, when you come off a half shooting 65% like you did in the second, having another game, you know, two days later on that short rest, does it make it easier to kind of ride the confidence for your shooters? Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've had an interesting season in that respect. You know, there's times when our offense has really been clicking, and there's times when we've been off. You know, we, the last game we played before yesterday, we shot one for 16 from three, and uh, then yesterday we make 11. You know, I look at our team and say, we've got, we've got good three-point shooters. But I think you have to be able to establish that you can throw it inside and score, drive and kick, drive and finish, drive, get to the free throw line, throw it inside, get to the free throw line. Over the course of your entire body of work, you've got to be able to do all those things. To beat a team that's won 30 games, you better be able to do all those things, or at least attempt to do all those things uh, to beat them. Fran, uh, off of that, Tennessee has allowed 15 threes in each of their last two games. As a coach, how do you kind of balance taking advantage of that while also trying to avoid guys settling for too many shots? I, I think that's, that's something I th you probably deal with every game, you know, especially when you have multiple three-point shooters like we do. At what point do you settle? At what point do you work the ball? And you're hoping every game that your guys truly understand the difference as it relates to time and score. Uh, what defense are they in? Yeah, I think Colgate's a, a team that probably shoots a lot of threes anyway, and so are we. But we also have, have won a number of games where we just, we just hammer that thing inside. So uh, we just hope that our guys make the proper decisions and uh, you want them to be confident. Coach Jordan said that he feels like Tennessee is different stylistically than any team you face this year. Do you agree with that? And how have all the teams you face this year prepared you to face that? Well, I think in the Big Ten, every team has a great coach. Every team has really talented players, three or four of whom expect to play in the NBA. Uh, I would say the same for the SEC. So uh, the difference, I, I think, when you look at Tennessee, they've got tremendous team speed. They're quick, uh, but they also can throw the ball inside. Uh, they also have three-point shooting. That's why they have the record that they have. But uh, 
You know, we feel like you look at Michigan State versus Maryland versus Penn State versus Nebraska, I mean, you go right on through our league, what it does is prepare you for different styles. Some teams play man, some teams play it, we'll put, mix it a little bit more. Some teams are a little more deliberate, some teams play faster. Uh, the one thing about Tennessee is, you know, they, they, can, they can go either way. They, they, they can go fast. I mean, you look at the Auburn game and the, the championship game, and that was, that was as, as up and down and athletic a game as, as I've seen in a long time. But they can also play half court. Uh, they've they got a great coach. And uh, they've got intelligent players that share the ball. I think it's one of the things that's impressed me most about them. They have really good players with big reputations, but everybody seems to put winning above everything else and move the ball. And that's why they're still playing. I know this is an old story for people that, that follow you every day, but for those of us who are new to Iowa, how do you uh, deal with a, a player who is also playing another varsity sport at the same time? Well, it's a little bit different because, you know, it's my son and, you know, obviously you're hoping that he can maximize his opportunity. You would want the same for anybody else. Uh, Coach Heller and I made, have an agreement that we're going to work together and do what makes sense. Uh, so we had a window of time after the Big Ten tournament ended where he could play in some games, which he did, and did really well. And then we had it set up. You know, had we lost yesterday, he'd be playing today in a doubleheader at Indiana. Is it too much? I don't think so. It's what he's always done. He's always gone from one sport to the other. Uh, he's thrilled to have the opportunity to play for our baseball team, has tremendous respect for Coach Heller and his teammates. He grew up playing baseball with a good number of those guys, uh, either played with them or against them. And you know, I think as long as we can manage it, while well, at the same time, uh, managing the academic side of it. He's an academic all Big Ten, so he's handling that part of it. We'll keep doing it that way. Yeah, they kind of brings up what, one of the quandaries that parents have as their kids grow up. And so many times you'll have even high school coaches that want them to specialize. I think I know what your belief is on this after that answer, but uh, what, what, do you, what do you think non-son uh, would do as he grows up and whether he can play two, three, four sports. It's interesting because you're so right. When, when you look at a lot, a lot of high school coaches just don't, won't allow it anymore. And uh, when we came to Iowa, we met with the folks at Iowa City West High School to make sure that the coaches were willing to work together because we felt like he, mm -hmm. this was something he was going to want to do. And it's a place where they, they welcome that. And, and we appreciated that. And I honestly think it helps you tremendously to continuously be competing mm -hmm. from one sport to the other. You know, there's nothing like having to get in that batter's box and have to hit something coming 95 miles an hour. Uh, and I think by the same token, you know, Connor's got to hit a big three yesterday and make an inbounds play to Luca Garza know at the exact time for him to hit a three. You're competing under pressure. And uh, I think it develops you in, in so many different ways. So I encourage it. I, you know, I like two sport athletes because what you know is you, you're getting is, is a competitor. Big stage is a big stage. Exactly. Exactly right. Go ahead. Uh, Fran, you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but you know, between Tennessee and yourself, two of the best teams in terms of offensive efficiency in the nation, how comfortable are you getting into a, a shootout, so to speak, with the Vols tomorrow? We're typically very comfortable getting into a shootout. Obviously, as any game goes on, adjustments are required. If you feel like you're losing the shootout at some point, I think you might have to slow it down. I think you have to be smart enough to recognize, all right, let's work the ball a little bit more. Uh, let's maybe try to shoot a few less threes and go inside a little bit more. Uh, let's put it on the deck and see if we can get to the free throw line a little bit more because we want to press. You know, if you get to the free throw line, you can get into your press a little bit easier. So uh, normally I would say if, if the game can be in the 90s, we'd be happy about that. Uh, but sometimes you've got to be careful, especially when you're playing a team of this caliber. Everybody good? Go ahead. 
Grant, it's been 20 years since Iowa got to the Sweet 16. What would it just mean for the program to get past this hurdle tomorrow? Oh, it would be tremendous. You know, we've come close. Uh, we all know how hard it is. I don't care where you are. It's very difficult to put it all together and, and get into the tournament and then advance once you get here. So I think our players all recognize the situation we're in and we would really love to have this experience for each other, but also for our fan base. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Coach. Good luck tomorrow.
before the article is written, right?
full starting contingent for Tennessee. And uh, Coach Barnes will join us momentarily. As you can see, Jordan Bone, Admiral Schofield, Lamonte Turner, Grant Williams, and Kyle Alexander. And again, please, especially with uh, all five of our players, please direct your question to a specific player. If you'd like multiple players to answer your question, then uh, just let us know that. But please have at least one name to start all your questions with. And we're ready to go. Lamonte, I know you guys, right here. Well, I know you guys have said you guys have allowed 15 threes in the last two games. You guys have said guys are just hitting tough shots. But do you think part of that is you guys allowing teams to get into a rhythm early and kind of getting things going? Yeah, I think um, in, in those games, um, our offense taking tough shots, uh, not getting the shot that we, we want, not making them work, kind of leading out to you know them opening the floor and kind of driving and kicking and them getting the momentum. So I think it's our offense that kind of leads to stuff like that. A uh, question for Grant. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tyler Cook, Iowa's power forward, and what have you seen from him, if you've watched him this year? Uh, very talented. I've known him for a couple of years. Uh, Tyler's very athletic. He's uh, dominant in, in the post. Um, he's developed his game a lot, and tremendous respect for him. He's done a lot through, through EYBL and every, everything. He's always been a talented player, so we just decided to play him. Jordan, that was a good, that was a good question about knowing other guys. Um, generally, with teams that you match up against, how, mu how much do you know them because of AAU days or, or playing with them somewhere maybe in the same area as you did in high school? No, any team in particular that you, you play. How many times do you run into guys that you know other than matching up with them during the course of a year? Right. Um, you know, I've ran into a couple guys. Um, you know, I have a lot of guys that, you know, played on the circuit with me in the AAU days. Um, I've seen a lot of familiar faces. I'm not really sure how to put names with them, but I've definitely seen a lot of familiar faces. So um, I just think it's really exciting and shows how important the AAU is, um, you know, just playing in the circuit, um, getting that exposure, and now just seeing everybody all together on this large playing field of uh, NCAA basketball just means a lot. Jordan, question for you. Um, now that you're back at this stage, have you at all thought about, or maybe it's just a memory, that, that last shot last year against Loyola? Yeah, uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about that Loyola game. Uh, I mean, I feel like moving forward from that, you know, it, it's definitely something that you remember. Um, you know, I kind of used it as motivation during my off season. Um, and I feel like this team kind of uses moments like that, not just Loyola specifically, but, you know, tough losses and, you know, just kind of being in the trenches. We kind of use that as motivation in order for us to be the team that we are today. Um, and I feel like it's very important to use moments like that as motivation to make you better. And, sorry, Go ahead. Grant, question for you. I mean, kind of along those lines, unfinished business, I think, is a key motivator for a lot of teams at this stage. How much do you feel like this group just takes that personally? I know for us, just the type of competitors we are, that we're going to come in with the mindset we're going to play every game to the best of our ability. But there's always that extra motivation because we've never been counted on. We've never been like boosted up. Anytime we've gotten up, everyone wants to see us fall down. So it's just a matter of doing, being who we are and embracing that. Um, we understand that we're doing this for each other and not for anybody else. So um, that's the motivation that we have. Question for uh, Admiral. Uh, you've had a lot of, you know, obviously had the big shots last night. You've had so many games this season where you've, you know, come up big down the stretch. Is there one moment you can point back to in your collegiate career that's helped you, you know, help springboard you into the leader you've become today? I think the biggest moment that helped me um, as far as leadership would be the Georgia game two years ago, I'm missing a game winning opportunity for my team and just seeing the disappointment on our faces when we knew our backs were against the wall. And I uh, just thought that from that point on, you know, I was going to do everything I could to help lead and be an example of what winning looks like. And uh, I just think from there on, I, I not just me, I think everyone sitting at this table did a great job of just instilling in everybody in, in our program that, you know, we won't be denied anymore from what we've been working hard for because we've been putting a lot of work in. So I would say that moment and also Coach Barnes, you know, running us a lot. But 
I think that that was a big motivator for us too to stop losing so we didn't have to run as much. Uh, this goes to Kyle. Kyle, how much fun are you guys having up here together, just as a group, you know, getting to experience the, the tournament and everything that kind of goes into it? You know, for some, it's kind of the last go around here. So i uh, just love to know your answer on that. I'm, I'm having a great time, personally. Uh, I love these guys. Uh, this is the, probably the funniest group of guys I've ever been around in my life. So uh, it's, always, it's, it's always a trip. But... Um, no, we're, we're having a great time enjoying this. You know, some guys, it's their first time. Um, it's great to have worked so hard that we got a chance to be back here together. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm loving it, I'm enjoying it, and I just hope that we make it last. Just for uh, Jordan Bowen, Jordan, just what, how much more prepared do you think you guys are for, for tomorrow because of last year? I mean, to, and just for, just for this moment. <laughs> hold up, hold up real quick. <laughs> No cell phones. Mom. No live broadcasting. Uh, that was my homeboy. My, sorry about that. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, no live broadcasting. <laughs> um, 17. You know, to answer your question, I think we're very prepared. Um, I feel like, you know, moments in the past kind of helped us get to this point. Um, even yesterday. Yesterday was tough, you know, playing against Colgate. But I feel like they prepared as well for a team like Iowa. Um, they're, they're very similar, even though Iowa is bigger, much more physical. It kind of gave us a taste of, you know, playing against guards that can hit the open shot, um, playing against random motion offense, um, just being on edge. I feel like they got us prepared for tomorrow. So um, I feel like all in all, we're just ready to attack tomorrow. Um, we were ready for this situation. We prepared. The preparation has been very important getting up to this point. So at this point, we just have to, you know, execute and do our game plan. Question for Admiral: uh, A guy like Luca Garza, who can pop out and hit those shots. How do you guys defend people like that? And maybe have you um, gone against guys like that earlier this year that you can kind of compare to? Um, well, we've gone against a lot of teams that have what we call like a prototypical stretch four, a guy that can step out and you know space the floor offensively. Um, but I mean, it's March. And I, like I said yesterday, it seems like everybody's percentage goes up at least 10 percent <laughs> in March. So um, all you can do is really just make the shots tough as possible. Um, and you know the game is never perfect, um, and they're a talented team. Uh, Luke, Luke Garza, he hit three yesterday, but you know his percentage doesn't say that he's a you know big time three point shooter. But that's just it's March, and guys are competing, and players make plays around this time of the year. So you got to respect everybody's uh, ability to shoot the ball, especially a team like Iowa. Um, and their, their pure motion offense is, is great because they get a lot of just different, get into a lot of different actions and space the floor and get their guys good shots and good looks and they move the ball well. So uh, basically you just got to communicate at a high level. And nothing's going to be perfect, but can't beat yourselves by giving them extra possessions or um, giving them offensive rebounds and things like that. So they're going to hit their shots, we're going to hit ours and you know we're both going to compete and it's going to be a good game. Lamonte, this time of year the, uh, the officials are also officials that you don't necessarily know from the SEC. Do you find that it is a different game depending on the officials that you have? <coughs> well, yeah, um, definitely for a guy like me that likes to get up and kind of pressure the ball, um, you kind of got to get a feel of, you know, what, what these officials call, um, like the different type of calls they call, you know, with like hand checks and stuff like that. So um, beginning of the game, coach always tells us to kind of, you know, get a feel for everything. That way you're not getting silly, silly fouls and stuff like that. So. Um, I think that's definitely big around this time of the year. Um, and being older guys, you know, you understand that different officials have different type of uh, calls and stuff like that. So, yeah. Nice. Anybody else? Great. Terrific job as always. We All appreciate it. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Kyle, you got to grow up, bro. Coach Barnes, just a couple of minutes. Grow,
Coach is well rested and ready for your questions. Go ahead. Rick, you've given up thir 15 threes the last two games. How much of that is a concern to you going forward? Well, some of those have been unbelievable shots uh, that I don't think we could defend it any, any other way than we did. I mean, they're going to make some of them, but they, some of the shots that all you can do is get as close as you can, try to contest a shot without fouling. And uh, some of those are really deep threes. And uh, we played two teams that have shot, shot it great. And, uh, but when you can win a game in the NCAA tournament when a team makes 15 threes like that and the crowd's pulling for them, and I thought we showed the maturity that we needed to show. And, but uh, us, it's not that we're not trying to defend the three-point line. It's not. I mean, you got to give them credit for they making the shots. I mean, it, it's not like they're layups either. They're, they're making shots from very deep range, and that's part of the game. And that three-point line is a great equalizer in some ways. Coach, you guys are pretty much in the exact same spot you were this time a year ago. How much more prepared or, or do you think your kids are to, to handle what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, I think, again, they realize how this time of year, how it's a matter of executing, doing what you have to do, and having a lot of respect for your opponent, which I know they do. And um, But uh, it's about, again, this time of year, Teams know each other. Uh, you know your own team. Every player should know his role, what he has to do, and you want to see your players do what, what you've asked them to do all year and do it at a very high level and, and know that um, it's going to be hard because uh, teams right now should be playing their best basketball. Coach, you said you're not guarding the three-point line, but maybe you're guarding personnel more, and does it make it more challenging when you have you know four shooters on the floor at a time like Iowa? Yeah, well, I mean, we played Auburn, they had five. You know, so it's, a, it's always a challenge when you have to guard the three-point line. And then you throw the fact in that Iowa's got an inside game too, where they, you know, they very much will play inside out. But if they get good looks at it, they're going to take it. I don't think they force a lot of threes. And, you know, we the last two opponents, they were going to live on that three-point line. I don't think Iowa feels they have to live back there. But certainly our last two opponents, have, you know, that's what they were willing to do, shoot 30, 40 threes if necessary. And, and – uh, but, yeah, that line is there, and you've got to deal with it. It's been there 32 years. Can, you, can yeah. you have imagined the evolution that we are here today and talking about taking 35 or 40 of those? Well, and, again, I looked at last night when I was watching the tape, and, you know, there's experimenting right now in the, in the uh, NIT with moving that line back. And I bet they made 10 of them yesterday behind that line. And uh, so maybe we should think about moving it back even further. But uh, the fact is it's been good for the game, and, and it's helped our game. And, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, teams go in it sometimes knowing they're going to shoot 30, 40 threes. Is there a mid-range game anymore? <coughs> we, be we believe in that. You know, we, uh, you know we, we do. We believe in that. And um, a lot of people want to either shoot a layup or shoot the three. But uh, we still believe there's a place for the mid-range game. Over here in the corner. Yeah, Rick, uh, how important is Kyle in this particular matchup, keeping him on the floor, of course, with Garza and then uh, Kreiner, also big, uh, you know, athletic bigs? It, it is important, but I think all of our frontline guys, you know, Kyle, Grant, I think Derek Walker will have to be ready to play, and, and John Fulkerson. But uh, and Kyle actually played, did a good job yesterday. You know, he really did, and, and uh, we got where we felt like we needed to go with some offense and we went with the small lineup that we, that's really one of our most efficient lineups and and uh but we need Kyle we're going to need him tomorrow and, and um we're expecting him to you know to give us a great effort and do his job coach it looked like I would change his defense a lot plays will work in a lot of zone just you know how important is it that you play inside out not get lured into well, settling like you like you say yeah I, well, I think it's important that we flow that we play and and um Yesterday, you know, they were back in there as far as you could probably go. And, and uh, I, I just I think that we've got to work hard at taking the slack out of it, get the ball moving, and, and do the things that we do. And, you know, we've been good against zones all year, really. <coughs> and we just got to continue to do what we've practiced all year and what, the way we played. And we got to get, but we got to get our post guys working better than they did yesterday. 
Rick Admiral had said that the springboard to him really becoming the clutch shot maker and the leader that he is today was that Georgia game two years ago in the SEC tournament. Do you agree with that? What's been your perspective? What, what on was it? What did he say? He said that the springboard for him to be able to you know make, make big shots now and lead the team the way he does was that Georgia game when he missed the three a few years ago. Do you agree with that, or what's been your perspective on his growth as a big shot maker and as a leader? Well, I think it, what I think of him, I think of the, the time he puts in the gym. I mean, I mean, he's in there working and working and working and. He's worked as hard as any player I've I've seen from the time that he started to where, you know, he was a very erratic three-point shooter and he wanted to shoot it, but he didn't know uh, when he should shoot it. And uh, – but he's put so much time in working on his shot and, and he's one of those guys when it leaves his hand and uh, he has his feet set, you think it's going in. <coughs> Yesterday you mentioned the team was anxious. Do you think that was just a matter of it just being the first game of the tournament, and do you expect that to continue tomorrow? No, again, I think the hard thing in this tournament is getting started, obviously, and, and I think that when you play the way we started out playing, and but we weren't really aggressive as we as we, we were making some shots early, and uh, and then we uh, – and when a team and, – and I can tell you, they made some tough shots. I mean, they, it's not like uh, – I mean, we gave them some where we broke down. Uh, in transition, but uh, the fact is, you got to give them credit. I mean, they made 15 threes, and I'm telling you, they were pretty tough threes to make. And uh, but I do think that we were a little bit anxious, and um, maybe wanting to get back to where we to have a chance to play again today, uh, whatever it may be. But I expect us now to come out and realize this is like playing a conference game against anybody in your league, where you know you have to be ready to play, and and. Um, and hope that we can play well. Is it about finding your rhythm, you think, after a little layoff? Yeah, I mean, we, we did, you know, we, it was, we played on Sunday and we had three, we had, uh, you know, three games in three days and we played three games in, I mean, I don't know how many hours and we knew coming into this, we had to get our legs back and get our, uh, more than anything, get our bodies back. And so we didn't do a lot coming into it. And, and I think, uh, some of it is getting your rhythm back and getting back to playing, and uh, and so that's. But now we we know what we've got to do. We've just got to go out and execute. Rick, I know that you're you're busy, always preparing for the next game. But this time of year, do you watch a lot of basketball? Do you watch a lot of other games? I don't personally. I don't because I don't want to get sidetracked on anything. I want to stay really locked in. And I, but I don't watch a lot during the season normally. I just I don't do that because I'm just going to. Because I tell our guys that we've got to stay locked into what we're doing, and and um, I watch a lot of film of us. I mean, you know, we film practice, and I, I do a lot of that uh, all the time. And uh, but I've got a great coaching staff that we're always uh, they're doing their jobs with scouting and know what they need to do. And um, but I, I just don't watch a lot of it in this time of year. Maybe because I feel like I'm in this hotel for a long time, I flip back and forth and all that, and watch some here or there. But I, I just I don't like watching a lot because I don't want to get my mind going in directions and thinking about things other than what I should be thinking about. Do you think your players, do, do they, are they basketball fans? Do they watch a lot? Oh, I think they watch everything. You know, <laughs> I think they, I think they're involved with it. But yet, and that's part of it too. You know, you, uh, it's a great time. I mean, it really is. And, and uh, like I, prior to coming here, we were back there watching the LSU uh, Maryland game like that. But. Uh, I don't have the patience right now to just to sit down and watch a game from start to finish unless it's got something to do directly with us. Rick, uh, Dave Jones from Penn Live, Philadelphia. Um, I know you started your career back here with Gary Williams and, and Fran Fraschilla and those guys. I think you were on that staff, right? Mm -hmm. And No, I was Fran. Well, Fran took my place. That's right. Um, I wondered if you saw this locale and, and took stock of your career. I mean, you had a hell of a career and, and where you were when you were a very young coach and George Mason and those places is, how, how are you different now in dealing with this circus than you would have been back then? Well, first of all, when I, uh, after a game yesterday, you know, uh, I, I thought back immediately to 19, I think it was 1979 where Fran McCaffrey and and uh, Sherman Dillard and I were working the University of Maryland basketball camp together. And uh, so we've known each other for a long time. And the very, one of the very first players we signed at George Mason was Sherman Dillard's brother, uh, Ricky. And uh, 
so we've we've known each other for for, for a long time and uh coming through here uh the year i was here i've told people maybe the greatest coaching job that i've ever been a part of was watching gary williams what he did my time one year with him here but it, you learn a lot you know I, I think as a young head coach you try to you sometimes can put a little bit more pressure on your team than you probably need to and because you, you you want it to you want to win and you realize one that it's not something you ever take for granted i mean there's a lot of teams now that uh i mean the thing is to get to this tournament every year that's got to be your goal and uh the way our business has turned into it seems like if you don't get there good things don't happen to you and uh or happen for you but i, I think you learn and you learn uh I think as I've gotten older, the biggest thing I've learned to trust my players more is probably as much as anything and know that uh, their hard work, they put into it, and you've got to let them play the game. And you can't joystick it all the time and think you're going to try to control every possession. And as a young coach, uh, I was probably guilty of that. Yeah. Everybody good? Terrific. Thank all right. you. Thank Great you job guys. as always, Coach. Good Thank luck. You. Appreciate it.
प्रेस कर देते सर Our thanks to uh, David Crisp for joining us, Noah Dickerson as well. Your questions, please direct them to uh, one or the other, and then if you'd like both to answer, uh, at least start with one, and then the, the other will logically follow. So we'll start with your questions. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, Elton Alexander with The Plain Dealer. I'll start with Noah, and, and David, you can back it up. Uh, as the tournament goes on, um, Post play uh, is often overlooked, but becomes more and more important. Um, can you talk about that both as a guy in the post <laughs> and as a point guard looking for baskets, you know, easy baskets, uh, although they're actually tough, but tough baskets, something you can get to, it really kind of goes at attacking the opposition. <clears throat> well, I mean, as a post player, uh, we do get overlooked a little bit, especially in a long tournament. But, you know, the longer the tournament goes on, the more guys get tired. Some maybe jump shots a little bit short and things like that. But the thing is, is when you're a post player, being around the basket, it's hard to be short. You know, you're right there at the basket. And so uh, just going and attacking the basket, shooting great field percentages, and then Look, uh, I get double teamed a lot, and then so it's a lot easier to make open jump shots when they're out there playing horse, when they're stepping into jump shots rather than shooting contested ones. So, you know. Yeah, for sure. To um, back up what he was saying, you know, when you got a great post player like um, like Noah, teams like to double team him a lot, and um, he's a great passer out of the post. So whenever teams send a double team, he's great at finding the open man and finding cutters. And uh, whenever they don't double, you know, he um, he puts guys, you know in a tough position because, you know, he can score. He got a lot of moves down there. He can finish with either hand. So, I mean, it's definitely uh, it works to our advantage. Is it, is it really playing horse, like you said? You saw us shoot yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Mike Topper from Spectrum News in Raleigh. This one's for Noah. Staying with that theme, I'm not sure how much you know about North Carolina yet, but they are a team that leads the country in rebounding. They get a lot of points in the paint. You know, how do you go about trying to slow them down and, and kind of stuff it in there to prevent some of those <coughs> close baskets? Uh, you know, we you know we play zone, and so we just playing with our strength, doing what we do. Uh, our zone is meant to stop that. We don't give up layups. We don't give up threes. And so, that uh, basically our game plan is the same thing we did every year. I mean, all year. David, this is obviously a unique time of the season. And you're seeing teams that you haven't necessarily prepared for, and you don't necessarily know their style because you're not that familiar with them. Familiarity with the officiating is also right. something that changes very much. And obviously, yesterday you had to make a big adjustment to that. Yes, for sure. You know, um, you know they uh, they called a lot of um, a lot of fouls that you know it could have been um, you know just overlooking the season. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's just something you just got to adjust to and um, just be smarter, make better decisions and, um, you know, just adjust to the game, but still being aggressive, though, not playing timid. Do you, do you try as a, as a team to make that adjustment early to find out how the game is going to be called and then go from there? Um, we just come out here and try and play as hard as we can, you know, stick to our game plan and leave it all out there, give extreme effort. And then, um, you know, we feel, we get a feel for how the refs are calling it. And, um, you know, we just adjust to that. But, you know, we always go in with the same approach. We're going to play very aggressive and um, give a lot of effort. Go ahead. Brett Freelander, North State Journal. Uh, David and then Noah, you can add your two cents in on this. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen Carolina a lot on TV. But being on the opposite side of the country, what do you know about them outside of what may have already been done with the scouting report here in the last couple hours? Um, you know, obviously everybody knows a historically great program. 
um, very well coached. Got a great coach over there. And, um, you know, they got some guys over there with some experience and um, guys who have been in this position before and, you know, got a lot of experience. So um, we knew that coming in. And uh, we know that for us to come out and have a, a great shot tomorrow, we're going to have to play really together, play really hard, a lot of effort, trust the game plan our coach has given us, and just go out there and leave everything out on the line. Uh, this is for either David or Noah. Mm -hmm. Noah had talked about the zone defense, which we've seen, and uh, we know where Coach Hop got that from. Uh, UNC sees Syracuse's zone twice a year. What makes your defense uh, stand out a little bit more and a little makes it a little more dangerous? Uh, we tend to try to take away the three completely. Uh, we extend our zone out so we, we don't give up threes and no layups. And so that says we don't, you know, the way basketball is going nowadays, people can shoot the ball from all over the place, all over the court, very deep. And so our zone really takes into account how people are shooting and try to take them out the game. David, did you want to respond to that? Um, I completely agree with Noah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good try response. Try to take that three ball away, for sure. And um, try to limit the um, high post touches as best as we can. George Willis, uh, New York Post down here. Uh, we see North Carolina in this situation year after year. What does it mean to your program to get to this point and be, and be in this spotlight? Uh, David, you can have it first. Um, it means a lot, a lot to our program, you know, especially how everything's been going down over the course of our, um, our four years here. You know, um, two years ago, we were 9-22, won two games at conference, you know, didn't make any postseason tournaments, anything. Terrible. You know, so two, <laughs> two years ago, nobody would expect us to be where we are now. So um, just making it as far as we have, it's been, um, you know, it's, it's been great. But, you know, we, we got to, we're still working. You know, we still we got more we want to achieve, so we're still hungry. For sure. Yeah, Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch for Noah. Uh, a little bit along those lines, you've been clearly the best team in your conference, but your conference has taken a decent amount of criticism this year. North Carolina is North Carolina from the ACC. Is there any element to you're playing for more than just your team, but playing for, for your conference as well? Uh, yeah. You know, when Oregon beat us at the Pac-12 tournament, we were shaking hands and all like, oh, we, now we got to go win some games just for the conference, you know? Uh, you know, our conference got a hit this year. The people are talking bad about us. It is what it is. Um, <clears throat> and so I do think we, we are playing for our conference just to get, show, so, show some more respect for us, you know what I mean? And I understand it's an East Coast bias. I understand because I'm from the East Coast. And so, uh, like, you know, it's understandable, but, you know, we do have some, some hoopers over there, over here. Mm -hmm. how, how does a kid from the East Coast end up in the uh, Pacific Northwest? Uh, man, I came out and visited during the summer, so it was really <laughs> nice out. It was really nice out. And so, like, I, I thought it was like that year round. I didn't think the rain was how they said it we was. Them. They did. No, they did for sure. For sure. Well, like, for sure. Uh, this question is for Noah. I was going to ask you about being from back east over here. I was going to ask you about being from back east, being from the Atlanta area. Uh, do you have you had any run-ins with any of the current Carolina players? Maybe oh, a Brandon yeah. Robinson oh, through yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah, so Brandon Robinson, he played for the Georgia Stars. He wasn't on my team, but he was on a couple years younger than me. Uh, Luke May, when I was a junior, when we were on our last year at AU, I played his team like seven, eight times that whole summer. About seven, eight times, as your parents talked a lot, got pretty close, and so I, I, I've, throughout the years, I was I've always been glad that he's been doing his little his thing at North Carolina. It's been a, you know, it's been fun to watch. How did you do against Luke? Guess we'll have to see tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was going to be my question as well. But what's it like when you have, um, again, post players that are allowed to play in the post as Hopefully, you two guys are. I mean, uh, you're not a lot of bunch of three points. I think Luke may take a couple more than you, but basically, you guys are ten feet in. Uh, just talk about that and talk about, you know, what it's like to to have thirty, forty minutes of that kind of basketball. Uh, you know, it's always fun. You know, uh, especially another guy that plays kind of just like me. Uh, you know, we've had these battles from years back now. Um, you know, it's tough, it's hard on your body, but it's, it's how I love to play the game of basketball. It's how I grew up playing it, and that's how I will always play it, you know. Mm -hmm. 
it's fun to me. And I like to do the dirty work. Up front here. Uh, George Willis again, New York Post. I e hope each of you can answer this, David and Noah. What was it about Coach that made you believe that he was going to be the right guy for the job? Oh, he's crazy. <laughs> uh, and I can honestly, you know, he's crazy. And I've had success at the high school level. I won two national championships, and my coach in high school was crazy. So I realized there's a line there, and he and he just, you know, he's just a man with a plan, and he's able to show show that plan, and it's where we sit now, you know, two years later. Yes, yeah, same thing Noah was saying. He's he's crazy, and that's the same with Noah. My coaches in the past, crazy, he's been crazy. It's, you know, I was, um, first phone call I had with him, he just told me, you know, pretty much his his life story, how he grew up. Told me he was a kid, always overlooked, always had a chip on his shoulder, and um, you know that clicked with me because that's the same way I felt growing up. And, you know, once he told me that, you know, we connected off of that, and then he just told me his vision, and um, he wasn't just telling me anything I wanted to hear. You know, he was telling me the truth, told, telling me everything he thought we could accomplish as long as the guys bought in. And so, you know, right from day one, I told him he got me, and I believed in his plan. Yeah, you know what I said? Man, we're sitting here today. Yeah, Noah, but both of you, really. How was he crazy? Could you explain how and why he's crazy and why that is a good thing and not a, a bad thing? Do y'all y'all haven't seen my man drop down and give you 10 push-ups in a press conference? Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? I, I'm not. But, you know, he's, man, his energy is contagious. You know, like, man, he's it's contagious. And it, it feeds, and we feed off that on the court, you know? And one second he can be going crazy, and next second he's the calmest person in the room. Like, like with him, you just you never know. You got to be ready for anything, and you know that's one of our models for the team. Does he ever run the old game film of himself at Syracuse? <laughs> nah, I saw it on Twitter one time. <laughs> <laughs> he like he looked a lot different with hair though. A lot, he looked a lot different with hair. He looked a lot different. I give I gave you two stories for first time experiences with him. First time I seen him in person. I was just coming, it was the springtime. I came in, he was coming, just got in town, about to do his press conference, and I introduced him to the head coach. He sees me from the top of the arena. He's in a full suit. And then he said, is that DC? He sprints down the stairs, runs across the court, and picks me up, gives me a big hug. And then the second one, our first workouts we have, he breaks his nose, because he's in there battling with us, like body, you know, trying to be scrappy with us, and he breaks his nose. <laughs> but um, he took it like a champ. He got up. He's like, man, I think I broke my nose. And then the next day, you see him, he got purple all over his eyes. But he's crazy, but it's definitely contagious, though. And it's a good crazy. It's a good crazy. Yeah, it's a good crazy. It's good crazy. You guys are tremendous. Thank you. Thank we appreciate your time. One, one more question. Go ahead. I, I, I guess after hearing this, what, what do you guys – when you see around the countries like, like, you know, all the brouhaha or whatever outside looking in with, with Coach Izzo and what you just said with Coach Hopkins, do you get the sense that people don't understand <laughs> uh, coach-player relationships? Oh, yeah. Are you talking about that tweet that came out on Twitter about Tom Izzo yelling at his player and stuff like that? Yeah, no, for a fact, because uh, I, I see, I seen it so many. You seen it, right? Yeah, I, yeah. Like it's, it's crazy to me because coaches yell at you. You know what I mean? And like, like he said in this press conference, if you weren't doing your job, you would hear, you'd be criticized about it too. You know, like it is what it is, and, and you, people get yelled at. You know, it's you're, you're men. You're 18, 19, 20. Like you're, you know, get over it. It is what it is. And a lot on top of that, a lot of people, you know, you don't see a lot of things that goes on behind closed doors. You know, you don't see the, the, um, the team meetings at coach's house. You know, you don't see the long conversations you have in the coach's offices. You know, you don't see how much coach is there for you. You know, they don't see that love that's always there. Mm -hmm. And when somebody, somebody loves you, you know, you're willing to let them push you, you know, to your limits. You know, and that's, that's what brings the greatness out of people. And so people don't understand that, you know, a lot of times with these coaches, 
you know, it's, it's more than just, oh, that's my coach. You know, it's, it's real family. love between yeah, them. It's, it's family. Yeah, so. families fight. Yeah. <laughs> I fight with my twin brother all the time mm -hmm. to this day. <laughs> all right. Very good. Thank you very much, as always, guys. Thank, Thank you. Me. Crazy Mike Hopkins will join us in a couple of minutes. <laughs> We now have the other side of the story. Mike Hopkins, uh, we, we will have to start out, Coach, by, by saying we had two particular witnesses previously that referred to you as crazy. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Not true. Not true at all. We, we did surmise that it was a good crazy. A good crazy. Yeah. Any of your questions? Go ahead. Bill Rabinovich from the club is special. Along those lines, I mean, it's not often that players call their coach crazy and as affectionately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, is it true that you did hug David Crisp the first time at your introductory press conference and that you broke your nose in first practice? That is true. Uh, I'm just pretty passionate and uh, I, just, I just love life and love being around my kids. and. Uh, you know, when David Chris told me he was staying, I, 
I probably could have suffocated him. I squeezed him so hard. Uh, but um, I just, I, I'm an interact. I like to interact. I like to be involved. I don't like to be the guy sitting on the, on, on the ceiling saying, run faster. You know, do I like to be involved? I like to, it's, it's my assistant coach in me that I love. That's, the, that's why I love it. I love the interaction with the kids and being out there sweating with them. Now, is that something that's, that's easily overlooked is when you come into a new situation as you did at Washington and you have to say, I got to get this guy, this guy, and this guy to stay. Is it more than we in the public realize? You know what it is, because you know, you're going to have one hour to meet with these kids uh, for them to make a decision for the rest of their life. Wow. And uh, I, I said it was a form of speed dating. You know, you had to be on, you had to be sitting there, and you're going from table, the guys were coming in, you're meeting with their families and sharing your vision. And, uh, you know, it was an incredible time. And, um, you know, a lot of those guys stayed with us, which was really, really special. And here we are. And, um, you know, we've grinded together, we've worked hard together, we've sweated together, staff, players, administrative staff. Uh, it's been a heck of a run. Uh Coach, I, I asked the players, and so I asked you on um, regarding the game, the importance of post-play as this con tournament continues to go on and on and on. It seems like uh, that becomes imperative. And it, come to find out, Noah said he and Luke have a history uh, together. So can you address, one, obviously, importance of post-play going forward, and two, just that matchup in particular? We, we, we have a program, we go inside out, we play inside out, and uh, believe in offensive balance. Um, having a great post player is like having a great penetrator. And then you have a guy who can not only score in a man-to-man -man situation, but he can pass out of double teams, and then he can make foul shots. Uh, that's a heck of a weapon. And this year, Noah's sacrificed a lot. Uh, last year he was all Pac-12, and this year they've double teamed and triple teamed him, have game plan around him, and it's opened up opportunities for the rest of the guys to step up and make plays, and that's where we've gotten better. We've become better with our balance. Um, I know this is the, kind of the corny coaching cliche, but we honestly have nine guys that could start for us. You know, Nas Carter came up big. Dom Green's been like that the whole year. Jamal Bay's coming on, came in and gave us a great eight minutes at the end. Sam Timmons has had great moments, and um, these guys have stayed together, positive, and could be a different guy either night. And it's 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 a luxury for a coach to have that. I don't know what their past is. I don't know what the history is. But you're talking about two incredible post players. Um, Luke is a guy. Uh, I saw when I was at Syracuse, and he just kept getting better and better, and he's turned into one of the best big guys in the country. He shoots it. He's great in the mid post. He can pass. He's an aggressive rebounder. I mean, I mean that's what you know. You talk about Carolina. You talk about their big guys. They've had great guards, but they're big guys. They're inside out. They try to crush you on the glass. They're, you know, that's what they do. And he's he's been a great player for them. Uh, Coach Mike Tober from Spectrum News in Raleigh. It wasn't that long ago this Washington program was well below 500, but the past two years, you know, back to back tournaments, you get a win yesterday. How have you got, gotten these guys to kind of buy in? And has this all kind of come together quicker than you might have thought? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, all we were trying to do is put in our offensive system, put in our defensive system, put in our culture system, and work hard every day. People say, you know, you never know. Some people, the learnability, I've worked with kids. You show them a move, 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 and it takes them a year to even get it. Uh, these guys and some guys just get it faster. And our guys kept believing. They've worked hard every day. And we, you know, we have a, a saying, DMGB, doesn't matter, get better. And so you lose by 30, doesn't matter, get better. Win by one, doesn't matter, get better. And uh, that's what we the guys have done. They've believed in what we've been selling with our defense, and they've gotten better at it. And um, it's been a, it's been a, it's been fun to watch them grow. And uh, I didn't, I, if I told you I knew the timeline or when we would get it, I would be lying to you. Um, you just never know. All you can do is work hard every day. That's kind of the culture that we have at University of Washington, and we just try to get better every day. 
Brett Friedlander, North State Journal. Is is the zone that you run pretty much the same thing you and Jimmy did in Syracuse, or are there a few wrinkles that you've thrown in now that it's your 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 system? And then, as familiar as Roy is with what you do, you're pretty much as familiar with with what he does. How much does that kind of play into the preparations for this? Well, like anything, uh, when you're playing against uh, the zone, you can't really mimic it in practice, or you're playing against. Carolina, you can't mimic how fast they push the ball up because that's what they do better than anybody in the country. And, uh, uh, you know, we run very similar zone. We have different type of personnel, so we, we, we have to utilize it a little bit differently based on our personnel. Um, and, uh, but it's all the foundation is definitely what we did at Syracuse. And, uh, you know, very familiar with, with North Carolina. I was very familiar with Coach Williams at uh, Kansas. We had played him multiple times. Um, one of the great coaches to ever do it and one of the great program, college basketball programs of all time. So it's an honor to even have the opportunity to play him. It's uh, for a coach and for a program that's trying to build, it's like a dream come true. You get a chance to play against the best of the best. I mean, what's better than that in March Madness time? Mike Pansy Armour with USA Today Sports. The guys talked about um, relishing that look on an opponent's face when you guys have frustrated them defensively and said that they saw it last night. How do you build that, you know, instill that in guys, maybe even more so than getting excited about offense? Well, you know what, it goes back to, you know, what your culture is. And our culture is, you know, defense travels. You can bring it anywhere. Uh, it's what you can control. You can't control, make the missed shots. Uh, but you can control how hard you play and how smart you play and how together you play. And uh, for us on the defensive end, it's, uh, it's something that we hang our hat on. And uh, it is like a Rubik's Cube. Uh, you know, we can make adjustments and it can frustrate teams. Um, but that goes back to when we're locked in and focused on our game plan and moving around and flying around. We've also proven in certain times when we haven't been locked in and haven't been focused uh, where teams can hurt it. Um, so hopefully we'll be that locked in and focused uh, for tomorrow. Uh, Coach Chris Egan, uh, King 5 TV Seattle. Uh, some people in the Northwest starting to compare you to Pete Carroll because of your high energy, your, your positive approach on the floor. Is this something you've just always had as a coach or was there another coach that kind of passed that philosophy to you? Uh, you know, I, I, the one lesson that I learned is be who you are. And I'm 49 going on 14 sometimes. I like to have fun. I like to interact. I've been very fortunate in my career to learn from some of the greatest coaches and be around some of the greatest coaches in the game. And um, uh, my high school coach, Gary McKnight, um, Bob Johnson was my sixth grade Little League baseball coach, the super quarterback coach, at, uh, high school coach at Michigan High School. Played for Jim Beheim. I uh, was with the Olympic team with Coach K. Um, I've been really lucky, and whenever you're around great coaches that um, have changed your life, you know, and you, you learn a little bit from everybody. So um, the one thing that they all have in common is they're all really simple. They're all great people. They all care about kids and developing kids, and most importantly, I know that they are who they are. And, you know, if I got to roll up my sleeves and take off my coat and everybody's like, why are you taking off your coat? I don't know. That's just what I do. I, I'm nervous. I don't know what happens. I feel like I'm in a sand trap on the golf course. You know, I just got to roll it up. It's going to be difficult. I start rolling it up, and that's just what it is. Um, so, um, just been very fortunate and learned from a lot of people. Noah, Noah mentioned that uh, his visit to the campus happened in the summer, and he recommended for your recruiting going forward that that was probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a plan? That's a plan. <laughs> That's a plan. Mike, uh, Art Teal, Sports Press Northwest. Um, history and tradition don't mean anything once the ball goes up and the game goes on, but you've come from a, a program that's had a lot of history and tradition itself. Well, where does that pay off in terms of prestige and that sort of thing? I just think, you know, we're, we're trying to, like, you know, the Carolinas and the Dukes and the Syracuses and the great Kentucky, the great programs, that's, that's what you strive to be. That's what your, your goal is. You, you know, you want to play against the best. Gonzaga, you, that's what you strive to be. And you try to do it your way, uh, you know, a standard of excellence. You know, um, what they represent, 
playing for something bigger than yourself. The Carolina way, the Husky way, you know, like that's what you're trying to be. And so to be able to have the opportunity to play against the best of the best is you see what it's like, you see what it feels like, you see what it smells like, you see what it looks like. That's how you learn, through experience. And it'll be an unbelievable opportunity for us to learn, to play, hopefully we can play well. And uh, it's gonna be a great, like I said, a great opportunity. Is there a point where you know you need to shut it off personally before a game you could prepare and, and not sleep for 24 hours. If, if you, uh, someone is, with your energy, I know. But. This is the best time. That's the, the best fatigue is after winning. I don't care. We'll be up all night. The staff was up all night. They looked like they hadn't slept in five days and all excited in practice. And so, you know, listen, we're in March Madness playing against North Carolina. I mean, is there anything better? And I told these guys, like, you know, we, you know, we, March Madness is an opportunity for Cinderella to have a chance to play for a national championship. We didn't come here just to get here. And that's not our standard. That's not what we're trying to do. You know, we got to have a game plan, go out and play against the best, see where we stand. And uh, hopefully we can execute a game plan and come out with a win. Phenomenal. Thank you. Great as always. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Good luck tomorrow.
books in there. So audio comes through on one channel. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks.
It's North Carolina time. Luke May is with us. And uh, we also have Garrison Brooks. And again, please specifically uh, direct your question to one or the other by their name. And uh, if you'd like both to ask, uh, answer your questions that you ask, uh, just start with one and say you'd like to hear from both. And I'll make it easier for everybody in our room, including our technical crew. Go ahead. Uh, Elton Alexander with the Plain Dealer. Uh, Luke, uh, just talk about the uh, games becoming more and more inside as you go further into the tournament. And also, um, uh, Noah was here earlier and said you guys have a little bit of history that uh, maybe you can share a little background with that as well. Uh, yeah, we're going to try to play the same way we've played all year, but I mean, it starts inside first, and myself and Garrison need to do our job on the glass and also making the shots inside that we, we can make. And I think the biggest thing for us is just continue to play our game and play how a coach wants us to play, and that's just doing our jobs and making it easier on the guards. And then um, with Noah, we played against each other in a lot of camps, and um, he played on a similar AAU circuit as I did. So we've played against each other a good amount, and he's always been a good friend, and I've enjoyed playing against him, and I'm going to enjoy playing against him tomorrow. Yeah, for Garrison, Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. For Garrison, but also Luke, you guys are a number one seed. You're considered one of the favorites in the tournament, but most of the year nationally, you've been overshadowed by Duke and Zion and all that stuff. How do you think that has affected you? Has it bothered you? Has it helped you guys in a way? Ah, that's crazy. I mean, I feel like it's helped us in a, a little bit. It gave, gave us a little bit of motivation. It's just, I mean, it's fine that people overlook us and like the national scene is fine, but we just uh, continue to work and get better every day. Yeah, I'd second that. I think the biggest thing for us is focusing on ourselves and making sure that we're doing what we can on the court to put us in the right position to where we are now and get a number one seed. And at the end of the day, everybody's going to play. and. Everybody's going to have their opinions on games and on players. And I think we're just trying to do our best to get the right image in people's minds. And Luke, that just would logically make sense, would it not, that you got to have a certain pride in the ACC to have the three number one seats. I mean, it's, it's good for everybody. Yes, sir. I think it's the best basketball conference. And I would uh, take that up with anybody. What kind of a, a adjustment uh, do you see, Garrison, when you, you do play a team that obviously uh, you're not familiar with? Is it, is it going to be advantageous that you've played Syracuse a couple of times during the course of the year and know that uh, Mike Hopkins has taken a lot of those basketball practices out to Washington? I mean, I think it helps. It benefits us. I mean, we've seen it before. I don't think it's – I don't think we've seen pretty much everything we need to see this season. I think we just do what we normally do, like just play our game. Is there always the adjustment of seeing a team on tape that you're not familiar with, thinking you got it, and then I mean, you went through it a little bit yesterday in the first half, yeah. and then you see them in person, and the reality hits. Yeah, I mean it's it's different. Film film doesn't do doesn't do some people the justice. Anybody else? Uh, Matt Calkins with the Seattle Times. Luke, it's been established you have a uh, history with Noah a little bit. Um, he was an all-conference player two years ago and didn't make it this year because I think everyone figured out. They have to double him, or, or they're going to be in trouble. Just as a one-on-one -on -one matchup, what's it like dealing with him in the post? Yeah, I mean, he's a great player. He's always been able to use his body really well, be able to finish over people. And for somebody who plays the five spot at right around 6'8", uh, some people list him as 6'9", but I feel like he's pretty similar size to me, maybe a little taller. And I think he does a good job of finding his areas and finding his angles. And he's a great scorer in the post. And we're just going to do our best to slow him down and make sure that we have a body in front of him in the basket every single play. But I mean, everybody at this stage is going to be really good. And I mean, in the respect to their leagues, everybody has a lot of accolades. And we're just trying to win a team game. And that's what we're going to try to do tomorrow. Garrison, is there a comfort level with the officiating during the regular season? Because you generally get three guys that you know. And then you come into the tournament. And you're, you're really not sure of these three guys, maybe one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how they're going to call a particular game. Yeah, I mean, I pre I'm pretty sure every, every referee is different. So, I mean, you have to really adjust to the style that they're going to blow the whistle for pretty much every call. Do you know five minutes in what it's going to be like, or does it change? 
you could tell you could pretty much tell from from the jump you could tell by the first foul like tell basically about how the first rebound basically that's how I feel go ahead uh, for both of you what is the most annoying aspect of playing against the Syracuse zone um, I'll go first I think the biggest thing is how active the top two defenders are I think I mean, I think one of their players um, is leading the country in steals and does a great job. I think it's Thibault does a great job of getting the passing lanes. We got to make sure that we make good fakes and uh, get it into the middle of the zone and try to do our best to uh, attack. And I think playing against Syracuse has helped us and it will help us moving forward. But then again, every team's different and every team has their strengths. And we just got to try to find our strengths against a good team like Washington. I'll agree with Luke by just saying like the the top two guys like they're they're really active. I mean, it makes it tough on like the whole team. Luke, is there additional pressure on you guys as a team because you've got Carolina on your jersey? I think it's definitely playing against any team. They're going to bring your their best shot, especially in the NCAA tournament. And I think going off of what happened last year, I think we're going to come out with a little bit extra motivation and making sure that we play our best basketball. I mean, we struggled a little bit the first half yesterday, and we can't have that let down tomorrow. And we just got to do our best to make sure we come out the right way and got to punch them in the mouth early. Was the adjustment at halftime yesterday more technical or emotional? I think it'd be more emotional. Um, coach got on us about playing a little bit harder, playing more passion. And he felt like we missed some shots we usually make, and they made some shots, and I think just playing harder and playing with more aggression would have benefit us in the second half. And we made some more shots and kind of affected them, which was big for us. I'm only asking this because the Washington players said that their coach was crazy. Uh, is there any part of Coach Williams that you find to be crazy? Uh, I, mean, I think I could probably speak on it a little bit more than Garrison just because I've been around four years and I've had a lot of experiences with different attitude changes, different mood swings. And I think the biggest thing for us is that coach gets on us and coach really wants to push us in different ways, whether it be yelling or kind of aggression. But I, mean, I think he knows it, that we, that he, he knows that we know that he cares about us and he wants us to realize how much he wants us to succeed. And that's the biggest thing that coach tries to imply every single day. And, no matter how hard he's on you or how mad he gets, you understand that because he shows you every single day. And that's been big for my growth and development. I think that's a good answer in protecting your playing time. I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> Thanks to uh, all your good questions and tremendous answers. Thank you, guys. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Coach Williams joins us momentarily.
thirty three o'clock. That's exactly when I shut it down. Yeah. We shouldn't be doing that <laughs> too long. Coach Williams joins us and uh, we are ready for your questions. Yep. Hey, Roy. Brett Friedlander, North State Journal. Okay. You guys have had some really good success over the years against Syracuse in that zone, and Mike's going to play pretty much the same kind of defense. What is it that has made you guys so successful at attacking that? Well, I'll give you a better answer after the game tomorrow night if we're successful against Mike's. It's a little different, but, I mean, at the basis, it's the same thing. But they're long, athletic, quick to the ball. Uh, they're aggressive. They probably double team in the corner, maybe more than Jimmy's teams have done the last couple of years. But uh, uh, for us, we try to get the shot we, that we want, not just the shot that they want us to take. And so for us, it's got to be a balance. We want to get the ball inside and attack the basket area and shoot open threes, uh, but not just be content just to pass the ball around the perimeter and uh, do what they want us to do. But uh, you know, it, the good news is that uh, we have played Syracuse because it would be hard to get ready for this type of defense with just uh, half a practice, which is what we're going to have today. And uh, But at the same time, some other teams have played a zone, and guys played some zone against us yesterday, and we didn't handle it very well in the first half particularly. But uh, uh, it is with their length, they take away your uh, open shots because they can – Football terminology, they can close on you like they talk about defensive backs. You think you're open and they can close. I can go all the way back to 2003, the national championship game. Uh, when I, my last game at Kansas, uh, we have what we think is a wide open three to tie the game. And Akeem Warwick came out of nowhere and blocked the shot. So you have to understand that, that they have athleticism and can really cover ground. And they want to get there. They want to bother your shot. But we got to try to get the shot we want. I, I can remember back to your Kansas team in 93, and when you talk about length, it seems like every team now has seven or eight of those guys you describe with length. And when you go back to earlier in your head coaching career, if a team had one, it was a story, wasn't it? Yeah, but these guys, I mean, they're for whether it's 6'7 up to 6'11, you know, and they, they do have the length and the athleticism to cover a lot of ground. Yes? Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. I apologize, you've been asked this many times this okay. year, but. You're a number one seed. Nobody's overlooking you. But you've been overshadowed to some degree by Duke and Zion Williamson, all that stuff. How do you think that has affected either negatively or positively you guys this year? Well, me, it hasn't affected me at all. I'm serious. Not one iota. I could, you know, that just doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't make me happy or anything. I just don't think about it. But uh, uh, I think Zion, the attention that he's gotten, he's deserved. Uh, he's... He's stood up to all the accolades that he got before. And I mean, we tried to recruit him as hard as I've ever recruited anybody. And I thought he was a, a unique uh, young man. There wasn't anybody like him. I mean, I've uh, been married for 46 years. My wife's been to a lot of high school games with me over the years. And I took her to a game when we saw Zion one night. And we left and we we're in the car and she didn't say anything, didn't say anything. I said, well, what do you think? She said, don't think I've ever seen anything like that. And I mean, that's pretty perceptive. And, you know, you watch the games, and that's what you say now. Man, I haven't seen anything like that. So I think he's uh, that blend of power and explosiveness, athleticism and competitiveness that I haven't seen maybe ever. But so that part hadn't bothered me. I mean, he deserves what he gets. And when we win, we get good publicity. If somebody else beats us, we, we don't. And uh, got to get ready for the next game. But I really haven't cared about it. Uh, Roy, uh, Art Teal, Sports Press Northwest. It's been a while since you encountered Washington in the uh, finals, and lots of things have changed. But I wondered what you remembered about that 2011 game in Charlotte when I guess you woke up sick that morning and uh, and got a little sicker as the game was going on. Yeah. yeah I remember they were very, very good. Uh, we were lucky to win the game. Uh, we have a three-point lead, and John Henson standing out of the basket, jumped up and sort of caught the ball. It was definitely going to be short, so it should not have been called goaltended. But I about had a heart attack because we got a three-point lead. I said, John, why would you do that? And he said, well, Coach, he was inside. It was just going to be two. You know, and I said, how do you know that? You know, that kind of thing. So that's what I remember the most about at the end of the game. <laughs> we got a great uh, deflection. They had, they had the ball out of bounds, I think, with just uh, for us a one- or two-point lead. and. John was able to get his hand on the ball in front of the ball and deflect it. We came up with it and he scored again on the other end. But uh, uh, Lorenzo was coaching, I believe, at that time. 
uh, Isaiah, I think, was there. They had they had some good players, and uh, I remember getting to the locker room thinking that we just beat a very, very, very good team, and we were lucky to win. Roy, Matt Calkins with the Seattle Times. I'm not sure how well you know Mike Hopkins, so there might not be a lot in there, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, yeah. He's he's a different guy. Uh, yesterday, he was trying to decide which candy he wanted on the scores table and played eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He tackles players uh, in the middle of practice, starts doing push-ups, all this kind of stuff. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you've come across where you go, that that's a different guy. It's, he's not like the other coaches. What the crap do you think people say about me? I spit in rivers. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Michael and our twins, you know, that's what the hell it is. Uh, I've never gone any, many, mighty mo with the candy on the side of the table, but I, I've got two different kinds in my pocket in the locker room. Right. You know. uh, I really think he's really a good guy, really a good coach. I'm old enough to remember when he played. Uh, I think he was so loyal to Jimmy and great for Jimmy Beheim for a long time, and Jimmy was loyal to him. Uh, the teams they had at Syracuse, they beat one of my teams in the uh, 2003 National Championship game. Uh, so I've known uh, Mike for a long time. Uh, two or three years ago, whenever it was, that Jimmy set out those nine games and Mike was in charge of the team. And it didn't go as well. I don't know what it was. It was four and five, five and four, three and six, six and three, whatever it was. But it wasn't very pleasant. And the first game that they played when Jimmy came back was against us at their place. And I remember grabbing Michael before the game and said, hey, I know that hadn't been the most pleasant experience, but you did a great job. It's a hard job. It's uh, unusual circumstances. Just put it behind you, and at one of these days, it'll be a very small blip on what you're doing. And and I don't know if he remembers that, but it was very comfortable me, for me to say that to him. And I think he's one of the good guys. Now, I've not many in the old days. I would do more crazy stuff, but I've stepped down and done push-ups on the floor and. So what you're describing is unique. That sounds normal to me. So <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> hey, Coach. Joe yes. Mazur, ABC 11 and uh, Raleigh. Um, you know, we got to find some storylines here, so we got to nitpick a little bit. Okay. Uh, three and three in the second round the last six years. Anything to that? Has it just been matchups that have been stumbling blocks, or what do you, do you read into it? Yeah, 99% of the coaches in the world would take that. I mean, seriously, three and three in the second round. Hell, a lot of guys are sitting home getting ready for their golf game. Uh, but uh, probably, let's see, Texas A&M last year was a really a bad matchup for us. The year before that, we were okay. You know, we, we were 6-0. and There wasn't anybody else 6-0. and So I'll take three and three all the time if you'll make two of those uh, three years go to play for the national championship game. So that would be the one I'd have the best answer for you. Frankly, my dear. <laughs> Any other questions for Coach? Didn't mean to shut the crowd up. I was being nice. <clears throat> Jacob Myers with the Columbus Dispatch. Um, Sterling Manley talked to him yesterday. And have you had it in your career where a situation like that, where a player has been playing enough and, and then gets hurt, and you have to sit him down because the rotation that you have has been so good? Just how has he kind of? been receptive to that? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I've, I've been a head coach for 31 years, so I'm sure I've had some things like it. But it, it depends. Before he got hurt, he was playing 11 or 12 minutes, but Garrison was in front of him. And Sterling was doing some things that uh, were good for us, or he wouldn't have been playing 11 or 12 minutes a game. But he got hurt for a long time. OK, and now coming back, uh, my job, be honest, if we don't win, I get fired. So my job is to win. And uh, the group that we have they got a pretty good rotation set. We won 15 out of 16 or 16 out of 18, something like that. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. But uh, I'm sure that I've had some guys that I was able to get back into the rotation. Uh, but it's where they started. You know, if a guy starts and beat everybody else out, then you got to try to give him a chance to do that too. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to think. Jock Vaughn at North at uh, Kansas, he. Broke his wrist, missed the first nine games. So when he started playing, you know what he did? He started because that's what he deserved over time. So I don't think there's been any exact situation like that. But, uh, uh, you know, Leakey was playing a certain number of minutes too and uh, not playing as many now as he was at that time. But none of those kids want to get hurt. Uh, and, and I understand that. And they want to play more. But every kid wants to play 60 minutes in a 40-minute game and 
take 60 shots, and I understand that. But uh, Sterling's handled it well, and he's practiced better now than he was before he got hurt. And so I like that. But, you know, his life in basketball is not going to be over tomorrow. Anybody else for coach? All right. All right, guys. Thanks thank very you. much. Good luck tomorrow. Oh.